Now starting, all attendees are in listen only mode. I know, it's blocking some of the words. <laughs> Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to Busan Malaysia introductory webinar, The Myth of Investing Decoded. I'm very pleased to have our master, live chair master trainer Shane Chu with us today. Hi yeah. Shane. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay, before we begin, let's go to disclaimer. So whatever we share today for the webinar is purely for educational purposes and in no way do we recommend a buy or sell call. So if you want to buy or sell anything, it's up to your own decision, okay? Uh, and before we begin, let's do a sound check. So for those of you who can hear me, can you please click the raise the hand button on the side panel? Okay, let's see. Okay, if you can hear me, please click. Correct. Right. Please click the raise the hand button. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, I still have a number of hands. Okay, yeah, all right. So everyone can put down your hand right That's now. Not Hannah, that is. This is a hand. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> okay. And this is our introductory webinar series uh, for this year. Today we are at the second series, The Mystery on Investing Decoded. And the next one will be Invest Busa on 30th October. Now, I want to introduce our speaker. Shane Chu is a financial speaker, trader, and investor with more than 10 years of experience. And he's also a certified professional trainer by IPMA UK. And as a speaker, he speaks regularly for Busa Young Investor Education Seminars, investment banks, and technical charting companies. He also designs and conducts stock simulation games for work and workshops for Busa Malaysia nationwide. And to date, he has trained more than 10,000 individuals in stock investment. And currently, he is a stock market analyst for City Plus FM on weekly Monday morning segment. So if you want to listen to his Monday morning segment, please tune in on time. And in 2015, he was acknowledged by President Obama for his work as a young leader in financial education. Thanks for having you yeah. here tonight, Shane. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Usually, I'm the moderator today. I'm very pleased to be a speaker. Yeah. So Shane, <laughs> can you tell us what are shares? All right. Um, yeah. From... So what I'll share is a lot of people want to go into investing and the first thing you need to get uh, to know well is what is the definition of shares. So what do you understand about shares? Now is share something that can make you money? Now share is a piece of ownership of the company. Okay, so when you buy into shares, you actually buy into an ownership of the company, a unit of the ownership of the company. So you must always think like that. Shares is not just an instrument for you to speculate in the market. If you want to take from a perspective of uh, investor, we should think long term and treat ourselves as an owner of the company. So when we buy into share, we actually buy into a piece of ownership of the company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So and uh, I think in our life today, our everything we do here has to do with uh, listed companies uh, one way or another and uh, just think about ourselves our life revolves around stocks so when you wake up in the morning you probably uh, switch off your aircon and your alarm rang and when alarm rang you're using iphone and iphone is by uh, uh, apple computer and uh, and then the cheap one of the chip is supp uh, supplied by our local semiconductor company uh, inari and when you switch off the aircon, probably aircon using Panasonic, and so a listed company here in Malaysia. And when you go head down for, uh, head down for breakfast or you brush your teeth, some of your toothpaste is also distributed by the uh, uh, local companies. And we go down and make your breakfast, your your Milo. You're actually consuming like Nestle products, or you drink your Nescafe. Nestle also listed companies. So when you go to work, you probably drive a car. And uh, probably you drive uh, Proton, and it's by a well, uh, listed companies as well. It's Highcom. So when you go to the uh, go out to work, then you have to pass through several highways, and mm -hmm. these highways are also developed by the uh, uh, our listed companies here on Busan, Malaysia. And uh, until you get to your lunch, and come back home, and then you do your leisure activities, and 
go online to buy your uh, year-end flight tickets or in Air Asia, you know, when you use your phone, Maxis, Cellcom, you know, DG, and all of them are also listed companies. So in our daily life, everything we do, almost everything that we do in one way or another is linked to a listed companies that provide the products and solution to you. Mm -hmm. so, so next time you just think about yourself, instead of just being a consumer of the product, can we also be an owner of the company? Wow, very interesting right. definition. Thank you for the illustration. Now, before we move forward, let us launch a poll to see what are shares. So what are shares? Is it a unit of debt to company or a unit of ownership to company? Let's have 15 seconds for you to answer. Okay, I see a lot of people have voted. Now we just give you five more seconds. All right, okay, let's see the poll answers. All right, so 97% of you answered that shares are a unit of ownership to a company. Good job. So most of you answered correctly. Now, uh, Shin, back to you. How do we identify uh, which shares are profitable? Which shares are profitable? So to, to know which shares are profitable, of course, we need to look at, uh, I wouldn't say which shares are profitable, but we want to know which companies are profitable. So to know which companies are profitable, you need to go to, uh, you need to go to a financial statements mm -hmm. and find out which are the stocks that actually deliver uh, better performance every single year. That means their earnings are getting higher and then uh, their uh, revenue is also getting higher. So so we can go to the find the listed companies financial statements. They need to report every quarterly to Bursa Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So their financial statements are made public and made transparent. So you can go to bursamalaysia.com or to go to the listed company respective investor relations uh, chapter to go and find out their uh, financial statement and see whether they are profitable or not. But if you look at over the past uh, 49 years, okay, over the past 49 years, you've purchased into 1,000 power brand shares since 1967, and held it over a period of 49 years, your initial investment will have grown to 2.9 million at the end of 2016, and you'll receive 1.2 million worth of dividend. Now, isn't that a lot of money to you? Yeah, that is a lot of money, but is there any reasons for us to not to invest? Oh, well, um, uh, some people, even though they look at how positive or how lucrative it can be when you buy into a profitable company with proven business model, uh, they oftentimes also choose uh, not to invest. Huh? There are a couple of reasons I can think of. Firstly, is probably they think that investment is for the rich because some people will have this mindset, oh, it's investment is not for me investment could probably be for rich people and you know i don't have a lot of money to begin with i just earn a decent income uh, three four thousand a month it's not for me but the truth is investment is not only for the rich mm -hmm. i think it's for people who want to be rich so that's the idea so so long that if you have an intention want to be wealthier want to be richer i think you should go into investment but uh uh, you know, I, if I look around my friends uh, who are in uh, very young, in their late twenties or early thirties, and um, many of them become uh, richer, wealthier, and successful at a young age uh, through a few areas. First is either they do uh, business, second is they do investment. So if you want to be rich, you need to do investment. And most of our friends here don't come from a very rich background; they come mm -hmm. from a humble beginning. And because they engage in investment, they engage in business. That's why they become richer. So, mm -hmm. and, and so we have to get more people to do more investment. Yes, 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 yeah. And uh, the second reason people don't invest is that they think that investment is very high risk. And uh, they may probably watch a number of uh, dramas or that, that talk about uh, people jumping off the roof, people committing suicide because they uh, made the wrong bet in the stock market and that caused them this kind of emotional distress when they heard about the term stock investing but in fact stock investing is not that risky 
if you know how to do that. You know, people think it's risky, but that's for people who don't know what is stock investing. But stock investing can be very safe as well. So long that you buy into companies, buy into ownership companies with proven track record and with the uh, the uh, with the proven business models that can deliver tremendous uh, results. I mean, good results every quarter. So for this kind of companies buying into a good quality fundamental stocks, I think the risk become very minimal. Now, just let's face it, anything that we do, do we have risk? I'm sure you have risk, right? If we ask you to cross the route today, do you think that's a risk? Yes, definitely. There yeah, is. but do you, do you think that it's very risky to cross the road and you don't leave your house? No, impossible. Yeah, impossible. Right? So in anything that we do, there's a risk. But you can't say that I don't want to leave my house because there's a risk. No, I don't want to drive because driving is risky. I've seen a lot of accidents. Now, so long that you learn how to protect yourself, like put on a safety belt, you know, wear helmets when you ride a motorbike, these are all risk management techniques. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if people are not aware of all the financial product which is shares then if you engage in shares investing treating share market like casino then it's very risky for you now the third reason is you now people often say i'm not interested so if you're not interested then this one i can't help you huh? now four reason is no capital to invest now does it really require a lot of capital to begin with for investing i don't think so yeah so i think how much do you think uh, you need to mm. begin with how about 1,000 ringgit? Oh, well, uh, you actually don't need 1,000 ringgit oh, okay. to get started in investing. You uh, probably need, uh, so long that you can afford to eat McDonald's, right? You can invest in stock. Wow, okay. So you need to get, for example, let's invest that. Let's think about the case that you buy into a, one, a 10 cent stock. So you buy into a 10 cent stock that is, you buy into one lot of 10 cent stock, which will cost you how much? Uh? 100 ringgit. One lot is 100 share, right? Mm. 100 share times 10 cents, so actually 10, 10 ringgit. ringgit. Yeah. Okay, so you no need, you no need, you only need 10 ringgit to get started in investing. But of course, if you invest in 10 ringgit, if you get 100% return, you also get 20 ringgit. La. So it's not significant enough to motivate you. Mm -hmm. So, but you don't really don't need a lot of money. If you have 1,000, you can also begin 1,000. If you have 100, you can begin 100. So to get some experience. So when you're more familiar with the market, they can put in your 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 into it. Mm -hmm. but, is your young investor especially for all of you today if you're a young investor you can begin with small cap, small capital like 100 ringgit 500 ringgit to begin with this is just for you to get enough experience so when that when you have increased the earning capacity then you improve or you put in more money to invest then you have gained enough experience to weather through the storms in the financial market and the fifth reason is people often say no it's too difficult to understand okay now so long that you put effort into understanding it, you should be able to get the idea. And a fear of loss, maybe you watch a lot of drama, see people, you know, uh, jump off the roof and so on. You develop this kind of phobia or you feel the market because sometimes market could be very volatile. You know, sometimes you go up, go down, it's a bit more uh, uh, dangerous. Now, so, but if you really know how to protect yourself, how to pick into the right company to invest in, then you shouldn't have to worry so much because either way the company will still be on a good outlook and and then even though the market goes adversely to your and then you can also take this opportunity to pick up the right a good quality stock at the lower price mm -hmm. i yeah. see now i want to sum this with a robot quote he said if you don't have the gut to take risk you'll be forever a poor man so if you think about you often fearful of loss you have a market uh, Robert Koch say that if you don't have the club to take risks, you will be forever a poor man. And he is the richest man yes. in Malaysia. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Who is also now in our uh, council of eminent people. Yeah. So we must listen to him. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so Shane, what are some of the reasons that we should invest? Now, uh, the number one reason that why we need to invest is firstly to increase our uh, current income because I'm sure that most of you here somehow or another feel that your income is not enough, right? So for those of you who think that your income is enough, uh, please raise your hand. <laughs> uh, so your income is enough, right? Yeah, not enough. I said enough, raise the hand. Oh, okay. not enough. Uh, I said not enough. Uh, not enough, put down your hands, okay? <laughs> so you know, a lot, I, I'm guessing that most of you will feel that your income is never enough. Uh -huh. And with the rising cost of living, if you don't invest, right, we, we don't know how to increase, have a, increase our current income. And secondly, 
is achieve financial goals. Probably you want to travel around the world. Uh, at night, you want to become financially free. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you want you to definitely... spend without looking at the price tag. Yeah, very nice. So that's why if you want to spend without looking at the price tag. You need to be uh, to do investing so that you can achieve financial goals and uh, improve the standard of living. And then most of us here have a lot of financial obligations, such as to pay for your pay for our children education, uh, to uh, cater for your uh, uh, aging parents and so on. So if we can increase our income, we can improve our standard of living, get a better car, get a better house, get a better furniture, so far so that our family members get to enjoy the fruits of our labor. So that's why we need to invest and uh, prepare for retirement. This is one thing that Malaysians really don't do, uh, don't plan for it. If you ask financial planners, majority of them will tell you that Many Malaysians, I don't have a statistic, but majority of the Malaysians really don't plan for their retirement. Okay, so now in investing, we can plan for retirement. We can put our invest our money into a basket of uh, uh, good quality stocks and leave it for maybe twenty years. Uh, this fund can be used for children education. So let's say you buy, you put uh, twenty thousands into a fund. Okay, every year you top out another five thousand. Okay, by the end of 20 years, maybe your kids will have grown up to need to go to college, then that fund probably is worth uh, six figure already. Maybe it's, uh, it's enough to pay for, or maybe six or seven figure. I, mm -hmm. You need to see how much you compound add up. So it's six or seven figure, you probably use this money to afford uh, a quality education for them. If you want to plan for retirement, you can also set aside some money to put into a good quality companies. Uh, not so high risk one, and then leave it for 20 years until your retirement, and this fund probably grow to a tens of millions so that you'll be able to live a comfortable life uh, after your retirement. So it's very important for us to learn how to, in, how to invest so that we can increase our current income and live the life that we desire, travel around the world, and also get our retirement life taken care of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See. But sometimes um, people would say that, you know, uh, I would like to invest some money. Where are you keeping it all now? Huh? It's credit cards and, and loans. Huh? Is credit card and loan an investment? No, definitely yeah, yeah. not. It's not an investment. Huh? So, and I mean, to talk about investment, we need to think about, uh, you need to only invest in assets, okay? So, uh, one example of asset is shares, okay? So, what are assets? Huh? So, assets are actually things that put money into your pocket with minimum labor. So, if you, if you, uh, if you put into, an item, but the item did not give you money into your pocket. Is that an asset? That's not an asset. And a lot of people, for example, they buy into a car and they think car is an asset, but actually car may not be an asset because uh, does the car give you, put money into your pocket? No, right? And uh, car actually take money out of pocket because every month, uh, you're servicing your car, Internet, right? Yeah. Petrol. Are you paying for your car? Yeah. yeah. So it's not an asset for you, right? Yeah, so, so some people, they buy a new car, they think that's asset, but it's actually not an asset. Actually, car is actually a liability. An asset are things that will put money into your pocket. But if you use the car to do Grab, to do Uber, then will the car give you money? Definitely. If yeah. it's more than my expenses. Huh? So is that an asset? Yeah. yeah. Asset. So, so long as the the, the car not give money into your pocket, that is an asset. Huh? So, but asset also things that you need to put in a minimum minimum labor. There's nothing come free, but you need to do something. For example, you need to do research to study the companies, you need to do research to study maybe a certain area of properties, investment. Then after that, after you do the research, you do the homework, you invest money into it, then only money comes to you. So that is assets. Huh? So the second thing is liabilities. So liabilities are actually things that take money away from your pocket. Okay, for example, uh, cars, you know. So these are liabilities. So anything that take money away from you from a pocket is a liability. The house they leave uh, can also be a liability because every month they are taking an installment to service them. You need to uh, pay for the maintenance, sinking fund, and so on. So that is a liabilities. Yeah. But sometimes we actually, you know, get confused with all the asset liability, and oftentimes we buy things we don't need with money we mm. don't have to impress people we don't like. Huh? 
So do you often do that? No, definitely uh, no. I have. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Before we move on, let's us launch a poll to test whether if you are listening to Shane. Now I have just launched a poll. All right. So the poll is asking you what are assets. I'll give you fifteen seconds to answer. Wow, you answer very quickly. All right. Five, four, three, two, 1.5, one, and time's up. All right. So, wow, 98% of you answered that. Assets are things that will put money into your pocket with minimum labor. Good job. So most this means most of you are listening. Now, Shane, I would like to ask you what is your what is your definition of investment? Okay, let me go back to my slide. Yeah. What's okay. your definition on investment? Well, um, definition of investment. Um, now I have uh, come across. A number of definitions but i remember there was this book that i read uh, which is written by this gentleman called benjamin graham and uh have you seen have you seen him before do you know who benjamin graham is uh, he wrote the book called security analysis and in this book there's this term he give definition of investment in this way which i think is one of the best uh definition for investment and uh by the way benjamin graham is the forefather of value investing and he's a teacher of Warren Buffett the world uh, number one investor so and the world one well, the world richest person mm -hmm. huh? so he says that uh, uh, an investment in is one which upon thorough analysis promises a safety of principle and, and an adequate return so anything that don't fulfill these three criteria is speculations mm -hmm. okay so for an investment to make sense, you must be able to, you first criteria is you must do thorough analysis. So you must research in detail and in depth about what the asset that you're going to invest in. And secondly is you might, you might ensure that uh, the company or the asset that you invest in can at least assure you of a safety of principle. Okay, it must at least assure you that there's a safety of principle. And the third criteria is must give you an adequate return. Any one of these three keywords is out, then it is not an investment. It is speculation. Mm -hmm. For example, you invest in something without doing due diligence, without doing the analysis, then you are speculating. Mm -hmm. If you do analysis, but the company cannot assure you the safety of principle, that's not an investment, that's mm -hmm. speculation. And uh, if you invest in something, can assure you the safety of principle but cannot give you any return is that investment no it's not right because we expect profit right when it comes to investments yes. so that's why you must fulfill all these three criteria one of them missing you are actually speculating in the market so this is a very important definition coming from the forefather of value investor and the teacher of warren buffett okay so three criteria for yeah. investment. Now I'm curious to know what is the difference between saving and investment? Is it the same thing? Okay, yeah, saving and investing actually is a bit, little bit different in such a way that you see, usually we do saving as very short term. Okay, we defer our spendings. Like for, for example, today we want to drink a Starbucks and then you feel that you know, Starbucks is a bit more expensive. So let me drink water. So you get a set of water and drink. So that is the first spending and saving has safety protection. So when you keep your money in the bank uh, for savings, give you a little bit of interest and then at least you're very sure 99.9999% that your money will be saved there. Huh? So there's a safety protection. But when it comes to investing, it's a little bit different. Investing, you usually invest for long term and we exchange money for something with the expectation of receiving a profit in the future. And because we expect a profit in the future, there's also a risk factor. That means sometimes at the end of the day, we actually did not get profit, we get losses. Mm. Okay, So that's why uh, as an investor, you need to really uh, think for yourself whether uh, the company that you invest in 
or the asset that you invest in can yield you a profit in the future. Okay, and one key distinction between saving and investing is that savings will not make you rich, but smart investment will. Savings is to save you from being poor. Now, all of you here, uh, including us, gentle reminder to everyone, need to save. Okay, we need to save. I, I, I'm not discouraging you from saving. You just need to save. But savings is, may not make you richer, but investing will make you rich. Okay, savings is to save you from being poor. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely makes sense. Yeah. So, hope I answer your question about saving yeah. and investing. Thank you. Yeah. So, what uh, do you think about investing? Some people say investing is like gambling. Is that true? Okay. Now, uh, what do you think? Uh? I <sighs> think with thorough research, you know your risk, then it's not a gamble. All right. So if you know the risk that is not a gamble, yes. it's like investing. Uh, huh? And why I say investing has risk factor, right? You know, uh, I want to tell you a story. Uh, in, uh, when I was uh, growing up, uh, uh, my mom kept telling me investing is like gambling. Oh. Okay. And uh, which is a very legit question that you asked today. You know, my, my, my parents came from very uh, financially illiterate background. So uh, never... Uh, have they mentioned to me or taught me about investing? For them, uh, uh, investing is like gambling. Okay, this you know, they watch. They have very negatively associated with with uh, the word investing. So, in fact, my, my parents don't really own much asset asset uh, a house. So, so that's why they, because they associate investing like uh, a gamble. But is that true? I definitely think it is not true. Okay. Now, if we compare between gambling and investing, we know that uh, when you do gambling, uh, there's not much information that you, you can you do. For example, you try to, you know, sometimes uh, China, uh, you go to a uh, casino, you see, you have heard people say, bet big or bet small, right? So these are purely luck, okay? Mm -hmm. There's no information. And uh, secondly, is you no know, some gambler, no plan, no strategy, just tempt out, okay? And um, everything based on luck, you own nothing, and gamblers are risk seeker. They have fun in uh, challenging their luck, okay? testing luck, and uh, no money management, no emotional management. Now, all this still true uh, uh, for average gambler. But if you are a professional poker player, it's a different story. You have a strategy, <laughs> and, you know? So some people come to the casino, they have a strategy. So these are professional gamblers, and uh, they, they, they go there with the objective to make money. So uh, but average folks, we go to the casino, uh, and we are actually testing our luck, you know, try to entertain ourselves. So these are gambling. But when we talk about investing, it's a different story. When we come to investing, the first criteria is you must have information. Okay, If you don't have information, actually you're not investing. Mm -hmm. You are gambling. Okay, So we must always look for information. Second criteria is you must have a plan or strategy. You must know exactly what you're doing. So that is the uh, second criteria. And the third is you must base it on analysis. You actually own the share of the company. Investor are usually risk averse like Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is one of the uh, uh, the world's most successful investor. And to him, uh, he is a capital uh, preservation list. Okay? He hates to lose money. So, But he still makes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. okay? So his criteria is, uh, if criteria is don't lose money in the market. Okay, and the second rule is don't forget a place rule. So, so you see, for work, for investors, we are risk averse. It's not that we don't take risk, we take calculated risk. All the risk we take is calculated. And we have a sound money management, we know exactly what we need to do if the market goes down, if the company didn't do well, you know. So we have good emotional management. So unlike gamblers, maybe sometimes when they got a bit more cranky, when they start to lose money, in a, uh, lose a streak, of, uh, over a streak of, uh, bats, you know, so then they get a bit more uh, cranky. Uh, I never seen, I never seen a gambler after lose money become very happy. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so so this is uh, the difference between gambling and investing. But having said that, can we do something fun with the audience there? Yeah, sure. Before we uh, go to our simulation uh, game, can we launch another poll? All right, I'm launching it now. So oh, which one? So this is asking you about which of the following is not about not true about investing. Investing is short term. Investing comes with the expectation of receiving a profit. 
and inv or investing carry risk. So we will have 15 seconds for you to answer. Wow, today's attendees all very pandai. They all answer correctly. Okay, I will close the poll. Now, 90% of you answer that investing is short term and another 7% answers that investing comes with the expectation of receiving profit. Another 2% answers that it carries risk. Okay, good for you. Okay, let's have a little fun right now. Uh, Shin mentions that he wants to Play a little quiz. Yeah, and uh, so on your screen now, uh, there are five objects, okay? And uh, the, the, the question, the, the way of this game is conducted is you need to guess after this slide what will be the object. So there will only be one object after this slide. So now you've seen on this current slide now, there are five objects. The first object is a car, second object is uh, an aeroplane, uh, third object is a speedboat, the fourth object is an electric train, and the final object is a motorbike. That one of them will appear after this slide. So your job is to try to get it right, okay? Which object is actually behind this slide? So, would so you how want do to... we know uh, what is the object after the next slide? Will you give us some tips? Oh, okay, sure. As, as an investor, I think at night you just do it right, huh? So, it's not so as an investor you need to look for information information yeah correctly so uh do you want to know yeah so so for those of you who is listening right now and you want to know more information you click the raise the hand button when there's enough click the raise hand button shane will show the first tip uh, all right. wow a lot of people put up their hands okay. okay now uh thank you so much for your great participation but if you don't have any tip, right, or any clue, right, the thing that you're doing is, is it investing or is it gambling? You're actually gambling, right? So if I ask you to pick an answer now, you probably pick a car or pick an aeroplane. How, what are our chances of getting it right? You have one fifth of the chance, right, which is 20% of getting it right. Correct? Correct. So that is gambling. That is not investing as gambling. Okay, but as an investor, we need to look for information that because of your overwhelming response, I'm going to share with you the first clue. The first clue of this quiz is that it can't fly. Oh, okay. okay. So that leaves us with only four options available. Yeah, so it can't fly. So what does it tell you? Uh? It's not the aeroplane. Uh, it's not the aeroplane, right? Yeah. So, so if you want more information, uh, in total, we have how many tips? Four tips, right? Uh, yeah, a number. Huh? A number, yeah. okay. So if you want to move on to the second tip, please put your raise, click the raise the hand button again. Wow, our attendees is all very attentive today. Yeah, all, all of them put up their hand. Okay, so because of your very <laughs> good response, I am willing to share with you another information. And the second information about the answer is it moves on land. Ah. Ah, so what does this information tell you? Only the car, the train, and the motorcycle. Ah, okay. So it tells you that uh, another thing is up, out, out, which mm. is the speedboat is out, right. right? So Do you have more tips? Uh, of course I have more tips if our audience today is very participative. Okay. Oh. <laughs> So do you know what you should do if you want more tips? Okay, let's check it out. Yeah, if you... Wow, okay. The, the... All right, thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> now, uh, the third clue that I want to reveal to you is that it is a personal vehicle. Ah, so okay. what does this tell you? Uh? That leaves us with only two options. Okay, and uh, would you want to have a final tip? Definitely, as many uh, tips as possible. Oh, uh, all right. So the final clue of this game is that you can only take one passenger and move slower than the other vehicle. Hmm. I think I know the answer. What All about right. you guys that is listening right now? You can type in the chat box, tell us. So can we just launch another? Yeah, let uh, us launch uh, another poll. Okay, so let us know which will be the image after this slide. Okay, so we have just launched the poll. You can pick one of the selection, the car, the aeroplane, the speedboat, 
the electric train or the motorbike? Okay, I'll give you a bit more time to answer. Wow, okay. Okay, all of you have answered. No. All right. 97% say that it's a motorbike and 3% say that it's a car. Is that your final answer? So Shane, are you ready to reveal the answer? Yes, um, definitely. Okay, and are you guys ready? Now the real answer is a car. Why? Why a car? All right. So the answer is a car. So why is it a car? No, this is a trick, huh? So if you look at all these five objects now, mm -hmm. which are on the screen, and uh, probably most of you have picked motorbike. Actually, this is a trap, huh? Why a trap? Because the car I want to show you, right? Actually, I only have is a Cooper car. Okay, you can only fetch uh, one uh, one passenger, and then you see. Actually, this car right has two stolen tires. I only show you got two tires, right? Oh. Not two tires got stolen, so that's why it moved slower than the other vehicle. Okay. Okay. So, so that's the idea about this quiz, huh? Now, only three percent of you get it right. Now, now sometimes, uh, sometimes, right? We uh, uh, we become very confident with the answer, and uh, you know, we we go out and uh borrow money to invest now now in this case uh, are all the cool clue pointing to one answer which mm. is the motorbike right Correct. so even though the 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 clues are pointing to the motorbike and there are a lot of facts to justify that motorbike should be the answer but sometimes uh we really are super confident not only we we invest the money in it we also go out and uh, get your friends to invest in it or you borrow money from along to invest in it. Let's say, uh, huh? Let's say the, the the idea of getting it right, right? The reward is one to one to uh five. Okay? That means if you put in ten thousand and got it right, you get a, a payout of fifty thousand. Let's say that's a this kind of payoff reward. And because you are overconfident and you want to make because it's great, you want to make a lot of money, you go and borrow money from you invested all your savings in it and you borrow money from your sister from your brother from your parents you will borrow money from your uh from along loan shark to invest in this motorbike to bet on this motorbike but eventually sometimes blue a uh, black swan event can happen it come out to be a car because this car got two stolen tires and it moves slower than the the bike you know so Sometimes this kind of black swan event will happen and all your savings will be wiped out, you know. Mm. So when you wipe out and you have a lot of debt, then would you be very uh, uh, devastated? Yeah, very I guess emotional. so you'll be very depressed, very demotivated and very devastated also. So, so, there's, uh, so the point I want to make here today is that uh, in investing, we need to invest within our means okay we should not invest uh beyond our means because the moment you be, invest beyond your means uh, so in this case i trapped you like, i use the car as an example uh, in fact all the clues are pointing to the motorbike so sometimes there are still some risk there even though you're 100 or 90 99 percent sure there are still one percent risk that mm. it might not be what you think okay so so you in any case where you're even though you are uh, very confident about a certain investment go up we also should not invest beyond our means mm. we must also invest within our means so this is a very important lesson that i want to put across to you because the moment that you invest beyond the means you get very emotional for example you borrow money from a loan shark or along then uh, you become very emotional because any tiny drop in the market you become very uh, nervous and emotional so then when you become emotional, you tend to make bad investment decisions. So in this case, please invest within your means. Mm. All right. All right. So is there any checklist of questions that we can go through before we make an investment decision? Yeah. So uh, for me, I often ask uh, our students ask themselves this question. First is what kind of risk involved in this company? Okay. Uh, or asset. 
that you want to invest in. Is there any risk involved? And if yes, what are the risks involved? Secondly, is what types of returns can I expect? Like, am I getting a huge payoff from the company or is there's a recurring income that go to me and uh, like in the form of dividend yield? And how quickly can I get my money back if I need it? Okay, if I want to, uh, you want to quickly get my money back, how soon can my asset convert to cash? Okay, so this another uh, question and maybe fourth is can I reduce my risk amount through that diversifications or other things so these are some questions that we need to ask okay. so uh, how do you describe an investor and how do we understand an investor uh, to describe an investor there are a couple of different investors some investors are uh, more aggressive some investors go for growth investing some of them are a bit more defensive they go for uh, value investing some of them go for dividend yield these are the income investing huh? but you ask me what is right for you right I actually uh, can't tell because I need to know a few few things from you okay so there's no one perfect portfolio for every investor uh, to create a portfolio that's right for you you need to know number one what is the risk preference are you the type that is uh, can take higher risk there are more that is more risk taker or are you the type that is more risk person mm -hmm. that you want to take a step back and really study thoroughly whether this company can uh, uh, make money is a good company or not and you dare not touch all these financial instruments that uh, have a leverage kind of uh, uh, the, the characteristic okay that can give you magnified returns and of course, also can magnify your losses. So these are you need to check whether this uh, risk appetite. I remember that when I was um, uh, let me think. I won when I was twenty one years old. So I'm trading these uh, options in the U.S. market. I was trading an uh, uh, an equity option in the New York Stock Exchange, and I remember that I have to really uh, uh, stay up late at night and to watch the market because when you do option right sometimes you can lose more than you put in so it is very uh, dangerous so so i need to carefully monitor my position so if i have position i need to stay uh, active and watch my position until very late in the night so and then i realized that i lost a lot of hairs and i realized that i did not have enough sleep so I need to know that uh, what are so these are things that if you can't if you can't uh, have enough risk appetite you don't go to the kind of asset for you so that's why you need to know what is your risk uh, preference mm -hmm. so if you are risk averse you go and trade option go and trade warrants go and trade futures these are very uh, uh, higher risk kind of instruments so and then you may not be able to sleep well at night because if you can't sleep well at night right uh, what is the point of compounding your money also no you actually jeopardize your health mm. for for the compounded return so i guess that uh, you don't want to become an investor have a miserable life right yeah, wealth yeah. cannot buy health yeah so so pick the one that's right for you now if you are a risk taker you go and invest in fixed deposit i'm guessing that you will notice your money is compounded at a very slower pace mm -hmm. and uh, you see if your money is compounded at a very slower pace right then you get a bit more uh, you lose interest in that instrument you see there's a vast difference in between low interest uh, low yielding asset and a high yielding asset so if you let's say you invest in a, a fixed deposit giving you three percent return if a fixed deposit giving you 3% return, uh, on average, right, if you take the rule of 72, uh, you take 72 divided by 3%, right, you actually get a, uh, you actually, rule of 72 determine like, how long you need uh, to double your money. If you take 3%, right, and according to the rule of 72, you need 24 years to double your money. Okay? But let's say you uh, increase your appetite. Okay? From six from three percent you actually get a return of six percent mm -hmm. okay according to the rule of 72 if your return is six percent right you 72 divided by six is actually 
12. 12, mm. right? So you cut short it by half, okay? You cut short it by half. So, so that means uh, you only need to take 12 years to double your money if you can get 6% return. Uh. Mm. But if you can get 10% return, then you actually take 7 years, uh, mm. 7.2 years to double your money. So you see, by just raising your return from 3% to 6%, actually you can get, you can cut short your uh, the time to double your money by half. So it's very incredible. So second uh, answer to this question you ask yourself is, uh, what is your time horizon? Okay, and some people they invest for a um, very short period. Some people invest for a long period. And some asset classes are really not meant for short period. For example, let's talk about uh, unit trust. So if you invest money in unit trust, the moment you invest in, there will be an initial sales charge of five for over percent. And there's also an annual asset management fee of uh, 1.5 to 2%. Okay. So the moment you put into your money, right? Let's say ten thousand, you put invest in it. The moment you put in it, the actual invested amount is nine over thousand. Let's say nine thousand five, nine thousand three. Okay, because you need to pay initial sales charge. So if you want to withdraw your, let's say the unit trust give you a yield of six percent a year. Okay, so uh, if six percent a year in half year, it give you three percent uh, on average. So if three in half year give you three percent. Then your fund also grow three percent, but actually you already lost lost out to lose out to your initial sales charge over five over percent. So you actually lose money in half year than you actually make money. Mm. That's why you need to know how long you can uh, hold the asset. So if you invest in property, you want to turn to cash, then it will take a longer period of time. So if you are really in a, you really in the uh, uh, you need to get the money back quickly, then you need to know what asset can give you the kind of liquidity. So uh, second criteria is investment time rather than third is amount of capital. So the, you, sometimes your amount of capital is too low. Some asset classes are not suitable for you. Sometimes uh, you want to have a bigger asset so that a bigger capital you can invest in the right asset. So so, so to answer that, what uh, what portfolio is right for you, we need to understand what is your risk preference, what is your investment time horizon, and what is the amount of capital. So is there any investment time horizon that you can suggest to us is it the longer the better um well it is not necessarily longer the better so it depends on your risk preference so if you can um uh, if you like the uh, fast money you want to try to time your money then you can use trading if you want to if you want to uh you want to let time to compound your money then you do investing. Mm -hmm. So investing, you look at longer perspective. So when you want to uh, time your money and fill it as fast as you can, we do trading. So in this case, if you look at investment time horizon, some longer investors are really holding for three to five years, mm -hmm. or some even for 20 years, some buy like public bank hold for 40 over years. Okay, then you have to see your one lot become a few millions in portfolio. And uh, for those, for uh, most people, I think, uh, most retail investors are shorter term, maybe about one or two years or less than one year. They sell, so they are short term one. And they are also opportunity investors. Sometimes they go long, short, necessary. Uh, that's me, okay? And uh, some people do intraday. I don't do intraday. I don't do intraday trading. But the last thing you want to do is depend on hot tip. Huh? Mm. Have you ever bought stock because of hot tip? No. You never. Uh, or you're very savvy. Yeah, very okay? stringent. Okay, so if you never buy stock, uh, you, you never buy stock because the, by pretending hot tips, you're doing it right. But if you buy stocks merely listening to tips, uh, then you actually run into a, a very high risk uh, venture. Okay, so because most of the time, I think about it, when the tip reach you, is probably too late. You would think about it, are we are you done street kind of people? I think mean, mm. most of retail investors are not uh, very. Uh, and it's not of a certain social status or certain uh, like extremely high net worth. So unless unless you are downstream street level kind of people, then you probably have a lot of first hand uh, information. First hand information because you're often surrounded by private bankers or people who are mm. uh, you have heard from your friends who are serving in the board, you know, so you have information so you easily for you to make 
a better judgment. Mm. But if you are a retail investor like us, the chances are when shit, when some news reach you, right, it's probably too late already. Like probably a lot of retail investors heard about the term that, like, you know, invest in this company, confirm make money one. Mm. Have you heard this before? Mm. Yes. Yeah. So confirm make money one. So probably you buy into it, you go out a bit, and then you did not sell, it go down, you see you lose money already, you sell. So that's why most of the retail investors lose money. So don't don't merely depend on hot tip. If some tip reaches you, ensure that you do your due diligence, do a thorough analysis, study the company. Okay, and uh, so there's also difference between investing and trading. A trading is more short term, investing is more long term. Huh? So investing is like in the context of relationships, like marriage. Mm. So you get married to the company until death do you both apart. So that's investing. Uh, well, trading is, on the other hand, is very short term. So we trade, uh, we look for every uh, opportunity, any uh, two ticks up, we chase the price, you know. So trading, on the other hand, is very short term. We probably do intraday, contraday, and so on, a few days, or maybe swing trading. So, so it is very short term. Trading is very technically driven. That means we look at the charts and see at what are the indicator telling us whether it's going up or going down. Investing is look at the company financials, whether it is a great company of investment grade, we can invest in it, then let it uh, let time compound money. Trading is you try to time your money and flip it as fast mm, as you can. Okay. So is there any type of products which we can invest in? Oh there are a lot of financial products that you can invest in. Uh -huh. uh, which one you have heard for? Uh, stocks. Uh, Bonds, unit trust. Okay, so there, are, you know, there are a lot of a uh, financial instruments that we can invest in, probably shares, bonds, uh, entities, uh, unit trusts, and so on. But uh, to find the right for you, uh, you need to find uh, if there's a risk and return. Now, have you heard of the term called a higher risk, higher return? Mm, yes. Yeah. So if you invest in low risk item, let's say fixed deposit, then your return will be very minimal because it should be justified because if you invest in something very low risk, uh, how can it give you high high return? Something is wrong. Yeah, not unless you really find a really good asset. Okay, but most of the asset, if the risk is low, the return is also low. But if the risk is higher, then the return is higher. But as I mentioned earlier, risk is actually contextual. Okay, uh, it depends on. So you need to understand the product. Okay, let's say today I ask you to drive a. Uh, Ferrari in the Serpang circuit at 250 km per hour. Is that dangerous for you? No? Yes, because yeah. I don't know how to uh, drive a fast car. Right, so if I ask Michael Schumacher to drive a uh, Ferrari, mm -hmm. okay, do you think it's uh, safe? Do you think it's dangerous for him? The risk is minimized the substantially. Risk, because he's trained, right? Yes. So that's why, so if you want to trade a certain instrument, if you know how to, if you know the product well, that your risk can be significantly reduced. That's where we say that risk is actually contextual. So if you want to invest in the higher risk items such as shares, such as, uh, such as the options, uh, futures, and so on, then that's a highly, uh, you need to really get yourself uh, educated about the products. So yeah, so with greater risk kind of greater return, but just remember that not all products that you come across is actually uh, licensed by securities commissions. Yeah, there are some that are not licensed. Mm. So just invest in those that like shares, warrants, REITs, exchange traded funds, you know, or property. So these are things that are uh, uh, like that are they have a license, okay, by securities commission. Mm, okay, thank you for the explanation. So now it's time for another poll to see to test if you are listening. All right, the poll. All right, the poll is asking which of the following is not a listed instrument on Bursa Malaysia. Ah, this is a tricky one. So you have 15 seconds to answer this. Hmm, very interesting answers. Hmm. Okay, so let's close and share the poll. 95% answered Forex. That is the correct answer. Forex is not a listed product under Busa Malaysia. Okay. 
So Shane, can you share uh, with us about the about the stocks listed under Busan Malaysia? Because I'm sure some of our friends here may have questions like, how do I know um, which of the stocks are Sharia compliant or not? Oh, oh sure, sure. Okay, so there are there are uh, if you want to know which stocks are listed in Busan Malaysia, you just go to uh, busanmalaysia.com and find what the stocks there are 900 over companies i think about 900 companies listed in the main market uh and another 100 plus in the ace market and uh, another few at the lead market so you just type the company you just find what are the company there and type search see whether you can search or not and it's, as far as the Sharia compliance concern so these are the Sharia compliant listed companies more than 70 percent of these public listed companies are Sharia compliant so don't have to worry that uh uh, don't have to worry too much that the uh, the company may not be Sharia compliant. So if they're Sharia compliant, there's an indication that there's a Sharia compliant. So, uh, but more than seventy percent Sharia compliant. So long as they don't get engaged in the uh, like a, a beer, like Gunting, the casino stocks, then uh, just remember that. Mm, okay. How about? Retail investors like me, can I be a millionaire? You definitely can. Investing? Okay, looking at you, I think you are very uh, brilliant. <laughs> so I'm sure you can become a millionaire. And I, like likewise for everybody, I think everyone of us here can be a millionaire in stock investing. The question is, how fast? Okay, mm -hmm. how fast can you become a millionaire? So, so to be a millionaire, one thing you need to acquire the skill is you need to have effective money management okay mm -hmm. you need to know how to manage your money well because if you can make twenty thousand ringgit a month but if you spend forty thousand ringgit a month okay you're actually on deficit mm -hmm. okay you're actually not rich uh you're actually running on deficit because you buy things you don't need to impress people you don't like okay mm -hmm. so that's what happened so if we can have effective money management, we can definitely become a millionaire. Now, uh, some of the habits of rich is that uh, financial formula of the method is that we usually uh, save after we spend. Okay, so like this formula, I is minus E is equal to saving. In other words, it is income minus expense become savings. Mm -hmm. So this is a financial formula of most people okay we have an income we spend on it already whatever left over is safe so that is the financial formula of the masses but for the rich they don't follow this formula this is the formula income minus saving is equal to expense in other words whatever they earn they set aside for a saving first whatever left only they spend mm. so they prioritize savings so which one is you uh, if i may ask i will choose to be the second one you choose to be a second one huh? now so so that's why we need to go for financial formula for the rich we need to save first before we spend so this is a good financial habit that you need to have and uh, if you have good financial habit for example you invest 50 ringgit a week into a fund paying 10 percent a year then you actually can get uh, about half a million in 30 years and if you smoke cigarettes one pack a day and decide to quit smoking and the money saved invest at giving you 10 percent return a year then it can you can get eight hundred and eight thousand in 30 years wow. so these are these are the good money habits uh. so if those of you who are smoking uh, i'm sure you don't smoke huh, no. do you? Okay, so if you don't smoke, right? You'll if you smoke, right? If you smoke, right? You deprive yourself of another chance to become a millionaire faster. Okay, so we need to ensure that we develop good money habits. Now, can I share with you a short way uh, to make become a millionaire? Yes, shall we? definitely. All right. So this is some of my formula. Uh. Every year, invest twenty percent of salary that grows at fifteen percent a year. Now get by investing in fifteen percent a year is literally you're doubling your money every five years. Mm -hmm. If you can achieve fifteen percent return a year, your capital will double every five years. So 
So every year, you set aside 20% of your salary that grow at 15% a year. For example, as young as maybe 20 over years old, let's say you get a, a annual salary of 3,000, sorry, monthly salary of 3,000, and in one year, how much money you will get? 36,000, 36, right? Because one year you get 3,000, one, uh, one month you get 3,000, one year you get 36,000. Okay, so uh, you invest, you set aside 20% of salary to investment, which is 7,002. And your portfolio grew at 15% return a year. That means you get 8,280 ringgit by the end of the year. Okay, and the second year, assuming that you do a great performance at work and uh, your your boss give you 5% increment. So it, your annual salary become 37,800. And you invest 20% of it into a fund, okay, into a stocks a portfolio. And you grow at 15% a year or so. So it becomes 18,000 your portfolio. And repeat it every year, your, your salary, uh, because you do a good job, uh, you have a salary revisions higher. Then every year you set aside 20% of salary. But at the end of 13 year, you, your portfolio will be, become 353,000. And by the end of 20th year, right, you have become, your portfolio will grow to 1.1 mil. Mm. Okay, that means you become a millionaire in 20 years. So let's say you started your career at 22 years old. By the end of 20 years, you're 42 years old, you have become a millionaire, 1.1 million. Only, in, only compounding at 15%. By the time you reach 52, you got 5 million. Okay? Wow. So everyone of you, everyone of us can become a millionaire. The question is how fast? If you want to be faster, there are a few ways. Uh, first, increase your capacity of earning. Secondly is you invest more of your income into investment. Third is you achieve a better returns. Instead of 15%, you achieve 30% or 20% return. If you achieve about 21% return, you can double your money every four years. You can achieve a 26% return, you can double your money every three years. Okay, mm. so that's the beauty, huh? So if you achieve an annual return of 20%, you'll be a millionaire in 17 years with just a starting monthly salary of 3,000 ringgit. Okay, so everyone of us here can be and deserve to be a millionaire. Mm. That's a minimum, huh? And I hope all of you here can be a billionaire, okay? Mm. Or multi millionaire, huh? Now, because the whole thing here is that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it, he who doesn't pays it. So that's from one of the greatest scientists uh, in the world, uh, Albert Einstein. Okay, and if you really can use compound effect to your advantage, one day you'll be like all these uh, successful investors, which are worth billions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for your session. Uh, now let's go to the Q&A session. So if you have any questions about today's session, please type into your chat box and we will be answering your questions. So let's look at the list of questions. We have our questions. Um, all right, our attendee is asking why the investor nowadays choose for short-term traders rather than investing for the future. Okay, uh, that is a good question because I am guessing that most of the retail investor here uh, or human beings per se are very uh, short term. Okay, we like things fast, okay, especially young people, you know, run things fast. We see, oh, there's a, uh, some quick buck to make. We imagine ourselves making like additional two, three hundred ringgit a month or so. So that's why they want to become. Uh, a, a trader. They look very short term. They want to make money. They want to see the income every month. And uh, that's why they become a uh, trader. Uh, sometimes people get a bit more uh, greedy. Uh, they become, uh, 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 so that's why they will want something faster. For example, you know, nowadays we all feel the, the, the pinch of the, the rising cost of living, right? And then do you agree that yeah, definitely. things are getting more and more expensive? And then, uh, so when things get more and more expensive, uh, retail investor or especially young people will want will want to get uh, something fast. And if you say that, oh, 10, 15% return a year, 
too slow, lah. Mm. You know, they want to get 10, 15 percent return a month. Okay, like 20 percent return a month. Okay, then they result they they resolve into going into money game. Mm. So money game uh, get many people uh, burn the money because money game is not promising you 10 to 15 percent return a year. Mm. No, they promise you 15 to 20 percent return a month. No, mm. and uh, which is incredible because in 12 months, right? Your return could be 100 over percent, 200 over percent, which is a lot of uh, return. And uh, but that's why young people now are easily swayed by uh, this kind of money games mm -hmm. because they want things fast. But in trading, they can get to have maybe 10 percent return a month. Get to enjoy. If you are a really good trader, you can probably make 10 percent return a month. Or uh, because Sometimes one 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 day you can get one percent return, next day you aim for another one percent return. Mm -hmm. But you need to do it consistently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be consistent in trading, getting good profit in trading is not easy. Okay. But let's say young invest young investor now, they go to the market, instead of become investor, become a trader. So they think that one month can make ten percent. But chances are if you're not trained, maybe one month you make ten percent, second month you lose eight percent, uh, third month you make five percent, uh, fourth month you make four percent. You make four percent. The fifth month you lost twenty percent, and the sixth month you lost two percent. You know, so it's not consistent. So, if you are not experienced enough, chances are you may not get a consistent return. Like every month you get five percent, six percent, ten percent. If you can do that, then you really the portfolio really return very well. That's why I say that, uh, especially young investor, because of the rising cost of living, mm. chance, uh, sometimes we are pressured into it and want to get a faster return. That's why we go for trading. Mm. Thank you, Shane, for that answer. So our next question, our attendee is asking, can you share with us the signs of a market crash? A sign of market crash. Okay. Uh, for the one that is asking this question, are you concerned about uh, market crash? Or are you, or if you have read something about it? Now, for me, I always believe that in... Uh, the stock market precedes the economy. That means the stock market will move ahead of the economy. Uh, sometimes a uh, small market move maybe six months ahead of the economy. When stock market start to correct already, then economy start to slow down. Because investors like us, we read about economy stuff uh, almost like every day. I mean, I read about it, I talk about it, and uh, we are more we are more anticipating the future. So stock market will easily will be a leading indicator for the economy. But if stock market crash, the economy is going to crash. So what are the signs? One sign that I often look at is the economic indicators. Okay. So if the economic indicator, for example, the PMI or consumer confidence, retail sales, the, uh, um, uh, the GDP is slowing, that means Economy could come to a slowdown already. And uh, another faster indicator that I look at is a bit more advanced is the yield curve. So if the yield curve is is the yield curve is inverted, that means uh in, in the yield curve stands we usually reference the American market. If the US market yield curve is inverted, what is yield curve? Actually, yield curve plot the uh, the bond yield to the, uh, the, the, the the tenure of the bond, okay? The shorter the bond, usually the yield is lower. For example, if you ask you to invest in a bond, 30 years bond, mm. as opposed to a bond of the same credit background, that means same risk factor, okay? That means the same rating kind of bond, huh? Two years. Two year kind of bond, do you ask for higher yield or long? 30 years can't kind of ask for higher yield. 30 years. 30 years because the, the, the period is longer, right? Mm. So the longer the period, the higher the yield that it fetch, it should fetch up, right? Because there's a risk, bigger risk of uncertainty. So when the, there's a bigger risk of uncertainty, you demand a higher yield. So a normal yield curve would be like that, okay? It's an upward sloping. But sometimes during an economic uh, crashing before the market crash, right? The yield curve will be inverted. That means instead of upward sloping, uh, whereby the shorter, uh, shorter bond fetch a lower yield and higher bond 
tenor fetch a higher yield, uh, become the other way around. The shorter bond, two year bond, fetch a higher yield, let's say 2.8%, long gone, longer bond is fetching at 2.6%. See, this is where there's the yield curve is inverted. So the yield curve has been very accurate in predict, predicting the past seven financial crises. Mm -hmm. Okay. So over the past seven financial crises since uh, I think the 1960s, uh, uh, yield curve has been uh, very accurate in pointing out the financial crisis. That means when the yield curve show that's inverted, mm -hmm. the market will crash very soon. Okay. okay. So yield curve is another leading indicator of the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why well, this is a, bit, a little bit more advanced. But uh, when in general, the rule of thumb is if the market achieve very high valuation and uh, it cannot be justified by the earnings. Uh, for example, during the dot com crisis in uh, 2000, uh, to the year 2000, 2002, like that, the, uh, the American SP 500, the Schiller P ratio is 40 over. Okay. That means the 40 times over the, the 500, Fortune 500 companies' earnings. But if you look at uh, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the Schiller P ratio is about 26 or so. It's pretty high, right? And every time the market reaches a high valuation, it will tend to correct itself. Our current Schiller P ratio of Fortune 500 companies in America, S&P 500, is about 33 now. Mm. Now the P ratio is higher than the P ratio in 2008, which is the, during the subprime crisis, but lower than the dot-com bubble. So we are in the second uh, historical high P ratio for the American market. During the Great Depression in 1930s, the P ratio is doing at about 20 over. Mm. So now we have 33. So if the market becomes so expensive, the chances for it to correct itself is also higher. Thank you, Shane, for your answer. So our next question, they are asking about how do we ensure we have 15% investment return per annum and what if you put all your assets in one equity and you make 20% losses? Oh, if you put your your all your egg in the one equity and make 20% losses, then you lose 20%? Yeah, and how okay. do they ensure 15% uh return per annum okay to get 15% return uh in my opinion uh 40 percent of your stocks should go to uh large cap blue chips mm. okay blue chip counter that means these are counters that are very stable that are uh proven track record of doing business listed probably in over 10 over years uh have a mature product and services that cater to a, a mature group of customers. Then company which are blue chip, big cap, should be able to deliver you 10 to 15% return a year. And then you can set aside another uh, uh, 40 to 50% of your stocks into uh, growth stocks. Growth stocks are smaller cap stocks which have a uh, which have a bigger market that have not tapped into yet. They have a new product, new service, or they have new distribution channels that can reach out to a new segment of market. You put your, you put your invest 40 to 50% of your uh, money into these kind of growth stocks, then you should be able to get um, maybe 15, uh, 15 to 20% return. So if you have a balanced portfolio of between blue chip stock and the high growth stocks, then you should be able to get 50% return a year. But so long that these are all investment grade stocks. Mm. So the keyword is to diversify. Yeah, instead of one stock, uh, mm. you know, diversify, then you can have a, you know, the more diversified you are, the more consistent is the return. Mm. Okay. okay. The, the, the smaller company invest in, then the smaller number of company invest in, then of course the return will tend to be more volatile, sometimes 10%, sometimes 30%, sometimes 50%, sometimes negative 20%. Okay? Mm, okay, thank you for your answer. Our next question, our attendee is asking, what do we need to watch out for when creating an account? Aside from commission fees, is there any different uh, when opening a global trading account? They're asking about trading. Okay, so uh, what are the criteria to look at, right? Mm. So if you want to look at uh, 
uh, brokers, of course, uh, you need to find a brokers that are reliable, ensure that they are, they are licensed brokers in Malaysia uh, to be to, to help retail investor like you to facilitate your share transaction, whether they're licensed or not. Secondly, their platform, are their platform good enough or not? Do they have, do they provide you the tools that you need, maybe your technical tools, the charting tools, or the fundamental tools that you need. You can pick the brokers that you like. Uh, there's another thing, uh, the brokers that provide you what you look for. Mm. And third is maybe it's the brokerage fee. Uh, you need to find a broker that charge you a reasonable fee. Of course, usually the lower the brokerage fee, uh, the lesser service you get. Uh. I say you only pay very low fee, let's say eight ringgit or maybe zero point eight. 0.5%, you don't expect a very good service from your dealer or devices. Uh. So if you pay a higher service fee, like house rate, like 0.42%, then you probably get, uh, you can ask your brokers more questions like warrants, conversion, you know, and so on. So so it's fee is another thing you can look at. Uh, if you are, if you are, if you want to be more DIY, then you can go for a lower brokerage tier one. If you want to, uh, you need, a lot of helps from your broker, then you uh, get a higher fee one. Mm -hmm. Then usually higher fee will provide better service to you. Mm -hmm. So you do, when you ask them questions, they respond, respond faster than you. <laughs> okay, so you get a higher fee. Okay. So that is uh, a, a reminder. So if the question is about global trading account. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So right. global trading account, uh, uh, local stocks brokers also provide. So you need to find a local stock brokers that can provide you the facility to trade the market that you want. I don't know which market are they looking at. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the US market, I think most of the brokers will provide you. If you look at the UK market, maybe some of the market brokers don't provide you. So, uh, but when we talk about global investing, then there are uh, a lot more consideration that you need to take into account. Okay, for example, the safety of fund and so on. Mm, all right, thank you, Shane, for your answer. We have another question. Uh, I think he or she is a new investor and they are asking, what are the financial instruments you can suggest for first-time investor? All right, a good question. For first-time investor, you can, to build your confidence, you can look into income stocks such as Real Estate Investment Trust, which is a uh, which is uh, investment trust set up to buy into properties, okay? real estate properties. So this real estate investment trust, they use the money to buy into shop lots, to buy into office suites, to buy into a residential area, to buy into commercial towers, to buy into industrial lots. And um, usually they fetch a very good rental from tenants. So the business model works like this. They buy property, they lease it out or they rent it out to tenants. They get a very good income. So the, the, this kind of risk, right, usually is pretty stable. The share price won't fluctuate too much. And they want to be tax efficient. They have to declare more than 90% of their profit to the uh, unit holders as dividend. So if you invest in REIT every maybe half year or one year, you can get what dividend, which probably range from 4 to 6%. Mm -hmm. So and when you do it long enough, you can build up a, a good passive income stream that can boost your confidence. So income stock is something that you can look at. Uh, second, secondly, you can look at uh, bigger cap stocks such as uh, uh, blue chip stocks, which have a light, uh, less, which have a lower likelihood to go under. I mean, to go bankrupt in the, in, in the event of a financial disaster, financial crisis, and so on. So these are uh, two types of uh, instruments that you can look at. Uh, by by like uh, big cap stocks such as uh, Nestle, you know, you 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 drink that. You consume the products every day, right? Uh, buy into a, maybe tissue paper, you know, consumer staple stocks or healthcare stocks. Okay, whether good time bad time people will still go to hospitals mm. for treatment. Good time bad time people will still drink Nescafe, eat Maggi Mee, you know. So these are businesses that that the uh, uh, have very defensive in nature. In other words, during a financial bad year, the company will still have business as usual, okay? Like, uh, uh, maybe for example, if you uh, like drink and buy into Heineken, but it's not Sarah compliant, Heineken, uh, Carlsberg. So, so these are very good time, bad time people still drink, right? mm -hmm. okay? Or Pampers, you know, good time, bad time people need, still need to use that, you know? It's not like a financial 
a disaster, okay, don't wear pampers, impossible, right? I mean, your kids still need it, right? Uh, utility companies such as uh, the Naga, you know, during good time, bad time, you still need to use electricity, right? Mm. So that's why the business will still be as usual, unlike some other companies where during business, uh, financially bad year, economy bad, then the business will take a hit. So this kind of defensive counters such as consumer staple stocks, healthcare stock, utility stock, they are less. The businesses are less likely to be affected by the financial downturn. So con can consider income stock, in summary, or defensive stocks, or blue chip stocks such as uh, maybe public bank. These are bigger cap stocks. Mm, all right. Thank you, Shane, for your answer. Now we have. One last question for tonight, and our attendee is asking, do you agree that ETF in Malaysia does not attract investors and there is not a lot of vol volatility in terms of volume? What ETF? In the introductory webinar, you already asked me ETF. Now, ETF is, um, what is ETF? I think majority of, if you are new to investing, maybe you don't understand really ETF. So let me explain what is ETF first. And ETF is like, a mutual fund that is traded on the stock exchange. So when the traditionally when you want to buy funds, right, you will go to uh fund, go to party mutual, go to buy, go to the uh, financial advisor that advise you is spin fund, Kananga fund, you know, uh, uh, uh Philly capital funds and uh, public mutual fund and so on. So and there's a middleman in between. The middleman in between is financial advisors. Okay, financial uh CFP, RFP, sometimes mm -hmm. they will distribute the funds to you. So, and there's a middleman. So, so to save the middleman cost, uh, some uh, fund decide to list their fund on stock market. So when they list their fund on stock market, it is exchange traded fund. So that's the meaning of exchange traded funds. So exchange traded fund, because it's listed on stock market, so when you buy the stock, buy the funds, right, you don't have to go through a middleman. You don't have to go through a financial advisor. So the minimum, the minimum cost, is safe. That's why investor uh, can save a lot of money there. So, but in regards to the question of ETF, uh, I would say that the ETF liquidity is still not that high in the market yet, but they're slowly picking up. So you can look into it. Uh, there are 10 ETF now available in the market. I think Bursa Malaysia is rolling out more ETF. I think more brokers are uh, designing new products to be listed on Busan Malaysia. I think in the next year or so, we can see that ETF will exceed 10, become 11, 20, and 12, and soon we will reach 20 and so on. So uh, the ETF market is an exciting space, and then the number of listed ETF is increasing every uh, year. So, but at the present moment, I would agree that the liquidity is still not that good, but I expect that the liquidity will pick up soon. Mm, all right. Thank you, Shane, for all your answers. Yeah. Now, um, to get you started on investing, uh, Busan Malaysia have some good news to share with everyone. And they have uh, introduced a waiver on stamp duty early of this year. And the stamp duty will be on shares for mid and small cap companies, which will be waived effective on 1st March 2018 for a period of three years. And not only on the stamp duty, they also waive on the on the contract notes for ETF and structured warrants. So it is also same, effective 1st January and for a period of three years. Now, if all of you feel that uh, today's webinar is not enough, no worries. We have another event called Busa Uni Day. Uh, and in this one day event, we will have a remarkable lineup of speakers. Uh, for example, we have uh, Mr. Fred Tan, Mr. Haji Asri, and Mr. Izun Constantine. Uh, so there will be a lot of uh, talks for the whole day. We will also be having entertaining performances and celebrity appearances. And also, you can learn through fantastic investing games, and there will also be a lot of delicious food trucks to fill your tummy. And importantly, we you can participate in learning and also bringing lucky draw prizes home. So if you are interested, please sign up on the link on the screen, uh, which I will send to you via the chat box now. All right. All right. I will also be there. So if you want to see me, want to talk to yeah. me, uh, please uh, meet me at yeah. Bursa Uni Day so, 2018. Yeah. So, right? so what are some lucky draw prizes that you give to them? Yeah, uh, we have uh, PS4, 
we have a Dr. Beats headphone and we also have our JBL portable speakers and many, many more. So we really hope to see you there and don't miss out on this free one-day event brought to you by Busa Malaysia. It is located at Monash University on the 20th of October. Is it free? Yes, it is free. Oh, so not only not only is this event educational but also free. Huh? And uh, I will be there if you want to uh, come and say hi to me, please go to Busa in the day 2018. Right. And for our next webinar, it will be on the 30th of October. The topic is Invest Busa, same time 8.30 to 10. And the registration link is, at, is as follow and I will also send in the chat box now. Yeah, so in the next webinar, I will share with you the nuts and bolts of investing in Busan, Malaysia. So please log on to our next webinar to know what is the technical things that you need to learn uh, to be able to invest profitably, consistently uh, in Busan, Malaysia. Yes, so thank you Shane for your time tonight and we hope to see you again. And thank you very much and good night. Yeah, thank you Anna for your kind invitations. Okay. Thank you. So I will see all of you uh, in the next webinar. Please uh, enjoy the, uh, the rest of the day and uh, hope that today my sharing has left some impact to you and see you at the top of your investing journey. Thank okay, bye you. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye.